All right, everyone. Um, welcome. Uh, some of you will hear a little bit of a repeat if you were here this morning. Um, I'm Samantha Bosshart, the executive director of the Saratoga Springs Preservation Foundation, and um, hopefully you are familiar with our organization. Our mission is to preserve and enhance the architectural and cultural landscape heritage of Saratoga Springs. It was established in 1977 when Saratoga looked far different um, than what it does today. And um, we do our, we fulfill our mission through advocacy, technical assistance to property owners, advocacy. Um, one of the most recent things that you may have seen in, in the news is our efforts to prevent the demolition of the long neglected and intentionally neglected properties on Pilot Street, where we have successfully paused uh, their demo demolition. And we are hopeful that new things and they have a future. So um, that's something that we've recently done. To, uh, as I said, technical assistance to building owners, uh, restoration projects, and of course, educational programs like today. Um, so if you are not already a member, um, I encourage you to become a member because that's how we can continue to do the good work that we do. At least I like to think it's good work. Um, and uh, also, if you are not aware yet, I mean, obviously you know about the event, but we we did a virtual historic homes tour. It was professionally done. It has some really wonderful houses and actually has great kind of fun drone footage all above Saratoga. That's really kind of an interesting perspective to see of Saratoga. So I'd encourage you, if you haven't bought a ticket to do that, that you can view it online and through midnight tomorrow night. If you still are looking for a Mother's Day gift or something, you know, uh, think about that. I want to thank uh, Joe Boken for graciously opening his doors and hosting this event. Here. In this great space, we were fortunate to have Carol Gadet earlier this morning to share the, the rich history of this place. And you're reminded that people, uh, buildings tell stories and, and, and help to keep uh, the stories of people alive. And, uh, that it's important to be good stewards to buildings. And uh, clearly the Boken family has done that here at this special spot. Um, I also wanna thank Little Market at Five Points for providing the food today. Um, just a few business items before I turn it over to our wonderful presenter, Charlie. Uh, please uh, silence your phones. Uh, you are asked to wear your mask when you're not seated. I broke that rule earlier this morning. I was like, oh, I'm taking pictures. And, so I apologize. Um, and if you're joining us on Zoom, please mute yourself. And if you have any questions, can, uh, you can use the chat feature, which Nicole is monitoring. And last but not least, uh, Charlie Kunzel is a native Saratogian uh, who has spent three decades as a science educator at the Saratoga Spring, Spring City School District uh, before retiring in 2000. Can you believe it's been 2000? I feel like it's, that was just like, you were just fresh from retiring not that long ago. Um, for years, he and Dave Patterson, you know, they're the dynamic duo, uh, educated and entertained thousands of Saratoga visitors, uh, fascinating them with um, stories about our city's architectural styles and resort location, mineral baths, and much more. Uh, he is currently the president of uh, our, our, I'd say our, community partner organization, the Saratoga Springs History Museum. And we're just so fortunate to have Charlie. And uh, I, I'm gonna do it now because if we don't do it now, uh, today is, I just was heard from a little girl. It's Charlie's birthday today. Happy birthday. And um, Charlie has always just been a great partner with us. Uh, he, if you haven't had a chance to go on one of his tours in the summer, uh, he always usually does a summer Sunday stroll for us. And uh, we're just excited to hear what he has to say about North Broadway. So thank you, Charlie. What is it, Sam, on or off? On? I can I? Okay. Well, good afternoon, everybody. And uh, I'm glad that uh, took advantage of this opportunity. I'm very humbled always when I get a call from preservation to see if I would be able to help them because 
Uh, they're a phenomenal group, as you know, but I know it more than anybody in, in the sense that we've just gone through a very tough year plus with COVID. And the number of times that we were on the phone together along with other groups, uh, what are you gonna do? How are we gonna work this? How are we gonna move past all this? How are we gonna keep paying the bills and keep ourselves open? So they've been wonderful partners and good friends of mine. And I'm, I'm always glad to help them out any way that I can. Um, this morning, I'm gonna try something that's kind of different. As you can imagine, uh, 38 years in a classroom, um, you kind of always wanna mix it up and you wanna to try to uh, give people, whether it's students or adults, kind of a different view on things. And uh, one of the things Dave and I used to embrace years ago was when there was a house tour and we were invited to do this, um, we would usually say which houses are picked, which neighborhood are we going to have people walking in, et cetera. And then we would try to tailor make something. Well, I'm, um, I'm gonna try like a, a drone attempt to this. You wait and see what I mean in a second. I'm trying something a little bit different today. But I, I titled this North Broadway, the subtitle and the development of Saratoga Springs is probably the most important part of it. So let's see if we can start things off here. Uh, before you throw things at me or, or think that I'm a little off base, I'm gonna propose a thought for you today. My thought is that cities can be like quilts, okay? Maybe too many years of science and de' Medici effect and Fibonacci numbers and stuff. But anyhow, here's a couple of thoughts. If you look back on the history of a quilt, they were so big in the 17 and 1800s. What were they? Well, they were obviously something that provided comfort mm -hmm. and covering. But mm -hmm. more importantly, when you talk to the maker or the family on this, we usually tell the family story. And the, they, the more you dug into it, you'd find that each of those little pieces of fabric maybe weren't big enough to put together something large, but the small piece could be woven or stitched together to make something that was very worthwhile and more important, something that told a story. And my concept and our thought today is, even though the houses that are being featured by our preservation friends are on the North Broadway neighborhood, isn't, aren't cities more like quilts? If you go up 10,000 feet and take a, an aerial view of an area, you start to begin to see, okay, there's different neighborhoods, and then there's a story in each of those. Just like the maker of this quilt might sit down and say, and point to one of the little squares of fabric and say, oh, that was from my wedding dress, or this was from our baby's first baby's blanket, or whatever. And it, everything had a story. And I think Saratoga's the same way. It's a great community. I know that firsthand, and I know you do too. But it's stitched together with so many good ideas. And the fabric of the city is so unique that the, um, the whole concept is if we take a step back and look, not just at North Broadway, but everything else, I think you can see how it all fits together. Now, the other thing that I wanna bring up is, um, I don't think great cities, and I'm gonna be bad, I think Saratoga is a great city. I've thought that for almost 70 years. So um, I just think that it's not by accident. First and foremost, it's the uh, elements of the population. And one thing that would make a great, um, a great article, Hollis, or, or maybe a, a talk in the future for one of us or something, would be uh, how many benefactors we had for the community that did things um, just to help the city out, not necessarily as, a, uh, a, as an elected official or anything else. So we've got a great community feel to us, but it's got history and there's pinpoints, I believe, and we can discuss this later on the, as sidebars, but I think there's key points throughout the history that started to steer us in the right direction that'll eventually give us North Broadway and beyond. So let's take a look. We'll talk about the beginning. As we used to say, a lot of times Dave and I used to say, every story has a beginning and our beginning is all with water. So you gotta remember, we were nothing around 1800. We had the geologic um, grace of uh, a fault that runs down through that uh, allowed naturally occurring highly effervescent mineral water to come to the surface. But um, we were nothing. Balsam Spa was way ahead of us, way ahead of us. In fact, uh, probably now it's two years ago, 
I debated um, a gentleman, uh, Jim Richmond, who was with the Ballston Historical Group on Saratoga versus Ballston. I love that. <laughs> a little contact sport there. It was fun. Um, and, and of course, the other thing that's fun on something like that is you know how it's going to come out. You know you're going to win. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's pretty good. But uh, one of the things that was definitely uh, true in the early days was they were way ahead of us. They were going after the water and we hadn't really caught on to it. So let's start on this slide with a few things. Like for instance, we have a lot, a lot to thank the Mohawk for. The Mohawk were the indigenous Native American tribe to this area. And even our name, Sarakataga, comes from a Mohawk term and eventually changed into Saratoga. And in 1771, we get our first summer visitor. Okay, Sir William Johnson, who lives in the Mohawk Valley because he is head of um, North American Indian Affairs for the Crown. Uh, Sir William is good friends with the Mohawk and he's not doing well physically. Now we can get into debates whether it's gout or an old uh, war injury or whatever, but he's not doing well and they feel badly for him. They carry him by litter, bring him down the Mohawk on a canoe, litter from approximately Schenectady up to the High Rock and he takes the waters for four days. He bathes in the water, he drinks it. And this is the catch. He walks most of the way home. Now, is that an endorsement or what, right? So as a result, he puts, as they would say, quill to parchment and starts writing letters to people and says, hey, I found this phenomenal spring. So as a result, everybody wants to ask the, the age old question, which is how do I get in? How do I get to the fountain of you? And eventually this area is opened up to Europeans, which it hadn't been before. The Mohawk kept everybody out. So first of all, we've got Sir William, I think, to uh, help with the fact that we're gonna get settlement. And here's a good one. A version of this has been added if you've had any communications with the city of Saratoga Springs or even watched a police car or any of the other government official cars go by, you'll notice that a variation of this is the city logo. It's a family, Mohawk family visiting High Rock. High Rock was a very important beginning part of Saratoga. And then I dug this out of our bolster collection one of our etchings that I really like of uh, Sir William at High Rock. Notice him in the background being carried by the Mohawk. Um, he's gonna start the whole movement here. And as a result, we're gonna start to build a city eventually. And it's gonna be initially around High Rock. So in the high ground above it where the old Bryan Inn is, we're gonna get Alexander Bryan and others that are gonna have log cabins and as they would say, they had, they operated like hotels, but they were mostly real strong taverns with a place to fall asleep later. Uh, and um, people came and um, I did quite a bit of research on those early days. And some of the things I found were amazing. The people that would come in the early days of Saratoga when this was it, this was the accommodations. They complained nonstop about the accommodations. In fact, quite a few of them said they didn't like the fact that they had to sleep in a hammock because there were so many rattlesnakes. Um, so that's something that, you know, you don't want to put on your uh, brochure or online or whatever. Um, but everything started right around here. Now, we're going to get real lucky because this is going to become a very prominent spring, but Gideon and Wanda Putnam are going to arrive. Now, I was just having a conversation in the hall about this. I like to lump the two of them together. She didn't get enough uh, press in the day without question, phenomenal woman, but the two of them have a vision. And we'll start off with when they came in the latter part of the 1700s to the Saratoga area, um, Gideon is attributed with a statement that, that said, this is a very healthy place. And he said it has the waters and of course it has timber. And he was a lumberman, so he knew he could make some money here. And uh, I cannot believe, I'll say this and I'll stand by it all the time, that if he had an idea, if it wasn't a joint idea, he and his wife worked very close together. Uh, phenomenal love story. And yet they, they just went on um, a phenomenal tear of what they were able to accomplish. Now, he looks at Saratoga and he's taken down the trees and turning them into dimensional lumber. Um, Staves, stakes, uh, shingles, things like that, sell, make make a living. 
but he also probably never walked through a uh, cornfield in Iowa to hear the words, if you build it, they'll come. But <laughs> I will say that he probably had that kind of a thought that he could see what we had as a potential to grow, which was the water. So he and his wife put together the first boarding house, which is gonna be on Broadway at the co Northwest corner of uh, Congress and um, Broadway. They're gonna to start to lay out the streets and develop the springs and they're going to be laughed at because there was nothing here. Literally nothing here. Everything was where? Baldston. Up here, nothing. Now he had purchased some land and he laid out part of what's today Broadway. And we've all heard of a bridge that goes nowhere. This was a street that went nowhere. It only went as far as they own. But he laid it out very large as I'll go into in a minute. But he had that vision and they did, they laughed. And at the end of the first year of 1802, um, he had built such a large hotel, accommodations were up to 70 people he could handle, which was pretty big for being in a wilderness with nothing around. Uh, they'd laughed at him. He ended up putting additions on because he had sold out so much. They called it Putnam Folly, didn't they? They did, they did. They, they made fun of it nonstop. Uh, there's all kinds of, of thoughts like, uh, anybody that would build something that big uh, is a fool, and it's you know all that stuff. Um, mostly people in the area, but that was predominantly Bolson Spa, and they were taking. <laughs> uh, that makes sense. Well, I don't think I'll have, be able to drive through that town after today. <laughs> but anyhow, yeah, um, that's exactly uh, you know because I could I can sense that there was from my work with uh, Mr. Richmond on this project that there was always you know that. You know, who's going to be first type thing. And uh, things worked out so well for him. I put as my last bulleted item by 1811, he's going to build another hotel across the street about on the property in Congress Park that has uh, the spirit of life uh, on it. And that's going to be Congress Hall. And that's his overflow. Well, he, he brought in labor from the surrounding areas. And this is another thing to consider. If you look at the co contiguous municipalities around us, you'll find that there were people in Greenfield, there were people in Wilton and Gansford. They were around, it's, it's just Saratoga's a late comer because the Mohawk didn't want anybody here. So there were people, it wasn't like it was totally void of uh, work. And I think, uh, I mean, he built a, a temporary cabin about where roughly where Impressions is and as workers, housed there while they were putting together a lot of projects. So he, he found the labor and made the money and paid them and started on that. But uh, he was on his way. Now, when they lay out Broadway, this, this is a, a key part for neighborhoods, I think. He's gonna lay out Broadway 120 feet from curb to curb, 120 feet. It's 1800, 120 feet from curb to curb. Now, my good friend and old business partner, Mr. Patterson, Dave Patterson and I, if you've ever seen us or talked to us or whatever, you know that we literally don't agree on much of anything. <laughs> um, uh, over 20 years in business together and everything else, we sat down one time without alcohol and tried to assess, <laughs> tried to assess the number of things we agreed on. And we had it last time at three, okay? <laughs> and one of them was, and, <laughs> yeah. One of them was that Gideon was a genius. Now, we, we carried that torch for a few years. And we said, you know, this guy's a genius. Think about it. He comes here. He buys the land. He's going to lay out a street. He lays out 120 feet from curb to curb because he knows in about 200 years, we're going to have two lanes of traffic going north, two <laughs> lanes going south, and parking on both sides. This guy is unbelievable. And after... We kind of, you know, said that for a while. We found more research that showed that he used to come and take down the trees. His wife would whitewash them and then he'd cut them down. And he had a huge wood cart that was pulled by uh, horses. And I finally found, it was 15 years ago, I found it in a correspondence yet. He said it took 120 feet to turn it around. <laughs> so Gideon is an incredibly practical person too. Don't be surprised. I mean, He's just amazing in terms of what, what he's done. But to, to lay out a street that big, and it was, a, first, you know this, it was called Broad Street, then eventually evolved into Broadway. And then the side streets at 66 feet, that was pretty, pretty impressive. So right away, he's setting the precedent for where we're gonna have neighborhoods and how big and how grand they can be.
because you can't have little cobbled stone paths that are gonna have mansions. You gotta have the right setting. Um, the other thing that I think is a very key part is um, when he lays out Broadway, in the early days, there was no designation North Broadway and Broadway or even South Broadway. It was just Broadway. And then we get a big thing happen. 1832, the first train pulls into town. And uh, in fact, one of his sons, Rockwell, and about six other men in town, put their money together and petitioned the state assembly and found that um, they could put out bonds to build a railroad. And they built the, only the second rail line to the, in the state of New York that came to Saratoga. That's what broke the back of the competition between the two cities, Boston and Saratoga. Because if you've got a hot shot transportation system of the day that's going to get you here faster, that's going to win. And the other thing which is, is definitely there is when you look at the hotel registers of the early days, uh, some of these would accommodate 2,000 people the whole season. Once the train is really going in earnest, 32, 33 and beyond, they're, they're bringing in 2,000 a week. So we're gonna build big hotels. We've got the beginnings of a very vibrant city. So there's a good picture of early Saratoga, a little bit swampy, a little bit of problems here and there, but we're starting to build in the wilderness. And eventually, this, this is something not, not a lot of people realize, is the area around Congress Spring, which is directly across from where Gideon's Hotel is, is gonna generate a lot of interest a lot of business, a lot of commerce is going to eventually go around him to support his hotel and their guests. But what, what else is going on at the same time? High Rock. So you've got a cluster of houses around High Rock, and now we've got clusters of people down there. We actually have two villages. And in the early days, it's referred to as the upper and the lower village. And eventually, they're going to grow together. And again, High Rock's the upper. Congress Park area is going to be the lower. He wants that to be a, a real concentrated area of development. And that's why he finds the Columbia Spring along with 1792, they find the Congress, but Columbia comes in later with his work. <coughs> Excuse me. And then eventually they grow into two. In fact, uh, this has always been fun for me. Uh, I've worked a lot of jobs, especially as a young kid on Broadway. And I used to love it when it was early morning or something and you could look down Broadway you ever notice if you're looking north, it's got the hitch in it, right yeah. at Division Street. Division was a boundary line of property. That's how the name came. And <coughs> it's kind of a nice little evolution of seeing, okay, the street comes, then the street comes. And they even moved Division Street at one point. Take a look at Division on Broadway and look straight up and you'll notice you have to move over as you go up. And that's because the big hotel of the United States that was built on that corner needed more space for uh, porches and things. So they literally picked up the road and moved it and made it 66 feet wider uh, of the hotel and then put a little dog leg in, in going up to the uh, rest of Division Street. But the, you, if you look hard, you start to see these evolutionary pieces. The other evolutionary piece that I think is really, really important is the date 1819. 1819, a group of people in the city decide that they're gonna partition uh, New York State Assembly for the right for self-government. Now, why? Fathers that were running the city at the time look at it and say, Boston Spa is still kind of kicking us around. How are we going to beat them? And, you know, we're coming along with hotels. We're coming along with bathhouses. Gideon's built the Hamilton bath. You know, all that's starting to come to be. We needed to play the card. Which card were we going to play? Well, we played the fun card. <clears throat> We're a fun place. We've been a fun place since 1819 because we passed the, they passed it in the state assembly that we had self-governance. And then in April of that year, they passed uh, some legislation locally that said we could sell alcohol in more places, list it out. Grocery stores were a major place. And then we allowed private card games and um, pool to be played. And of course, Gideon had built uh, Congress Hall, so some of the first pool tables were put in Congress Hall. We became the fun place, and uh, Boston stayed a little bit more puritanical. And as a result, we're going to win on a lot of bases, not only easier transportation, but who wants, you know, you want to have fun, right? <laughs> so, 
So when the railroad comes to town, everything is going to start and get a real shot in the arm by 1832. And we're going to start to flourish. And here's a picture looking at where the railroad line was on railroad place. And it's looking in, in beyond the area of Franklin Square. So, um, first railroad that came in, came in on ra were railroad places, but took a hard right and came down to Vision Street. And for the first year and a half or so, that was the, the station, so to speak, the endpoint, the terminus was right near, not on, but the Broadway Division Street intersection. And then they moved it back. And uh, of course, for those of you that have been in Saratoga a long time, you know that was the original rail station back there until they moved it out onto West Avenue. But we start to build the first upscale neighborhood. And of course that's Franklin Square. So Franklin Square is gonna start to build and it's gonna be you kind of pushed along by again, more people in town that are, we've got the right idea, the Marvin brothers, and we could do a whole talk on them, but uh, we won't. They were just very influential in the community and um, they had money and they also owned a lot of land on the west side of town. So they're gonna start a uh, interesting prospect, which is affordable housing. Mm -hmm. If you look at what we used to call the tree streets, mm -hmm. Elm and Ash and you know, over by Beekman and everything else, 40 and 50 foot frontages. That was done on purpose. They wanted to be able to sell small lots, especially to laborers that were coming in to build some of these bigger projects so that people that were blue collar, that were craftsmen could afford their own houses. But Franklin Square was still where the, the power of the money was. And they liked the Marvin brothers so much, you've probably heard the story that they wanted to call it uh, Marvin Square. And the Marvin brothers being as humble as they were said, no, we don't want to have our name attached to that. Let's give it to somebody a little bit more influential like Benjamin Franklin. So as a result, we get Franklin Square. And of course, Franklin Square starts to have a cluster of very upscale houses for the time. And look at this one. Beautiful house at Free Franklin. Really great. But look close at this. See the difference? Mm -hmm. This is a little bit more modest. Notice it's got box pillars, mm -hmm. cheaper. Okay, did a lot of that on a lot of the houses on Circular Street and other places. But it starts to show you, and this is where Sam and other people that are going to take you out on these tours are going to hit those architectural elements that you can start to become discerning with money, real money crazy money, that kind of thing. You know? <laughs> and this I think is, is just a nice little back and forth. So Franklin Square is going to be upscale, but it is not going to be at the apex, which we're going to see by the time we get to North Broadway. So North Broadway is going to build more palatial houses and notice the turned um, columns on this, a lot more money, a lot more square feet. And of course it's got its own story we'll get to in a minute. But we're also going to have kind of a downslide in uh, Franklin Square area. And one of the things I like to do is read the old uh, travel guides. And they really give you a lot of insight into, it'll tell you, you know, what every hotel is offering, et cetera, which is good. <clears throat> but then a lot of times it'll have little exposés about the neighborhoods and things. And they'll kind of give you a heads up as to what year everybody thought Circular Street was great or Union Avenue. Sorry. <clears throat> so as a result, um, these other neighborhoods are going to start to grow and we're going to get some of the great houses. I mean, Dave and I used to do about 300 conventions a year in town, and a lot of those were done with buses and things like that. <clears throat> and I know Hollis has done the same thing. And people are in love with big houses. They love big houses. And whether it's Hollis Palmer or Preservation, these guys know their houses and people are gaga over it. And without question, once we would take them on a, just a little break-in tour of the city, we would find the number one question that would pop up would be, can I get in any of those houses? <laughs> and of course, we always said, oh yeah, sure. Uh, as soon as the people have breakfast, we'll take you right through them, yeah? <laughs> no, that's what you should have said. Can you come back to work? The store? Sam, I did. I swear, I can give you Dave's phone number and he'll, he'll verify it in Florida right now, but uh, 
honest to God, <laughs> we used to say it was an event during the year, but not on a daily basis. Yeah. Somehow they were starting to think we were Newport or the Hudson Valley or something, and they could just kind of go in any time. But we're starting to get new neighborhoods. We're growing. And the big one that's going to do it is that post-Civil War America, we're going to have a big radical change <clears throat> after the Civil War. Um, as we all know, during the war, the northern businesses were uh, rooted in industry, which helped to win the war. But uh, the war was fought mostly on southern property, and their businesses were pretty much destroyed, and our businesses in the north flourished. So as a result, the money that was up here, and local, um, like, for instance, uh, canning and preserving food or making clothing. I mean, why did they call Troy the Collar City? I mean, <clears throat> ironworks, the monitors made part, most of it's made in Troy, New York, uh, as a Civil War battleship. Um, they all grew in size, and there was a lot of wealth in Troy. There was also a lot of wealth in Schenectady and Albany, too. And then we're going to start settling in the West, and a lot of people are going to go out and make huge fortunes in precious um, metals and uh, railroads and then even oil. So there's a progression. So we're going to have this change and it's going to be now we've got new money. And new money always likes to look like old money. <laughs> so <clears throat> we're the number one tourist destination in the United States in the 1800s. So they had to come here and I'll steal one of Hollis's thoughts to see and be seen. It's absolutely true. Part of the beauty of coming here was the fact that you could put on phenomenal clothes and parade around and go to the parties and be seen and marry off your kids. That was a contact sport back then too. Uh, it was a lot of reasons for people to come to Saratoga and it was based in how great it was and how much fun it was and everything else. But the new money is gonna come. And then of course, we're gonna get creative again and we're gonna start to build Broadway, North Broadway that is, and the new money is going to want big houses. So we start a big building boom. The houses are going to start to be built. But picture this, I made a list. Right after the American Civil War, 1871, we're going to build City Hall, which originally was almost twice as big vertically because of the bell tower. Many of the buildings on Broadway, Dave and I used to joke all the time that if we were doing a walking tour down Broadway, if somebody said, I love this building, you'd say 1871 and just, <laughs> and just keep moving because for the most part it was. And uh, the United States Hotel, big hotel, Grand Union, um, A.T. Stewart buys uh, the Grand Union Hotel, 1872 and does some renovations on it. He is uh, the father of the modern day uh, department store and he puts some money into it and literally raises it to a huge level, not only in opulence, but also in size, becomes one of the largest hotels in the world. And Grand Central Hotel is going to be around. It'll be one of the big four, only for four years, but it'll be around. Thank you so much. You're welcome. It's very cool. I appreciate it. Um, and then, then a lot of the mansions are going to come in at the same time. And then we've also got the other twist. We've got a guy named John Morrissey who's gonna run a little gambling place on Woodlawn Avenue, which at the time was known as Matilda Street. But he realized that, you know, he was listening to if you build it, they'll come too. And he eventually comes up to the idea of, I bet we can do something bigger with casino gambling. And then of course, prior to that, he'd even tested the waters with Saratoga Racetrack in 1863. Think about that. I mean, I'm not doing a lot on the racetrack, but. You know, we're talking August, the first few days of August of 1863. It's one month after the fall of Vicksburg and the Battle of Gettysburg. It's the height of the American Civil War. There's no horses. And we still draw huge thousands of people for the first inaugural year of racing in Saratoga. He could see it. Others could see it. We had potentials and we were going to build on it. So all of these things are going to be done in that period. The Bachelor Mansion. Broadway is going to start to really develop a lot of different things. The railroad is going to help with this. You start also looking at number of guests that are coming, but then you start to look at the amount of um, uh, material that's shipped in, especially food products that are going to come in from Boston. So we're going to have the lobster shipped in. We're going to have a lot more things to offer in these hotels. They're going to come up. It's a nice symbiotic relationship. You know, 
uh, rising waters raise all ships type thing. That's what we had. Um, the clubhouse, which was originally called when Morrissey opened it, because remember gambling, casino gambling was illegal back then. <clears throat> um, the clubhouse comes into play and then eventually after his death and everything, it goes to Canfield. And um, they're gonna pass by there on their way to the track. So they're gonna lose their money at the track during the day and they're gonna <laughs> use it there at night. It's a great relationship. We used to call it the Hoover effect where we could suck the money out of them at any point in the course of a day. So. But the hotels play a big important role in this and this is where you're gonna to start to get a different. Some people, big, big money, Vanderbilt and people like that, they're not going to want to build houses here. They're still going to want to build them Newport. Newport's not building hotels. We're building hotels. They're building walls around their mansions to keep people out. We've got a more interesting mix. Uh, Newport's going to stick closer to the vest in terms of social standards. And it was always said that, especially in these big hotels, the um, the moral, uh, the moral limits were always stretched quite a bit in Saratoga. Um, now they did have in these big hotels, especially the Grand Union, they, they had security. Tom Wynn was head of security at the Grand Union for quite a long time. And his guys would go around the, the floors of the hotel to make sure that at about 11 o'clock it was secured and no people from the outside could get in. But they eventually built a tremendous number of cottages in the backyard that were not over any kind of security. Mm -hmm. And you could get a hotel room here for 250 to 350 a night. The cottages without anybody watching who came and went, went for about 125 a night. Wow. So people found ways in which to get all their fun times in and stuff like that. And one of my, my jokes was when we would go through the um, hotel registers. <laughs> It would always be, you remember seeing on the movies, you know, the big register and somebody's going to check in, they roll it around, give you the pen. You have to sign your name, who you were traveling with, where you're from. And we would say, oh, look, somebody came in from here and here. And then we started looking at who they traveled with. It's amazing how many men came in with their nieces. <laughs> um, I, I don't know, we're still working on that. I, I'm not sure. But as a result, uh, that was all part of the dynamics. So now you're going to get that split. The new money wants to have the houses on North Broadway. And while other real money can be here for a while, stay in the hotels and be fine with it. So, so this is all a summation on that. Most of North Broadway is going to be built uh, starting after the American Civil War. And a lot of it's going to be North Broadway built by Troy people, capital district people. And I put down in the bottom, so many times we have found accounts where it'll say, that these mansions that they were living in were camps. We're going to our camp in Saratoga. And I used to say, if that's camp and I want to do that, I'll tell you. Um, most of them were built for summer use. They were going to get drained down. They were going to uh, be dormant for the rest of the year, but at the height of the season, they would all be open and everything else. Those of you that grew up here, you, you remember this. Remember the Saratogian used to publish the list of who came into which house at one date until we had a string of jewel robberies. Remember that? <laughs> All the jewelry got stolen and they were like, I wonder how that happened. And uh, that got stopped. But remember that was that was the tea table chat had all those kind of things and who was where and everything else. All the, all the neat stuff in town. So, but summer use only. And along the same thing, look at the planning. Um, the Marvin brothers started with those smaller building lots and set up the west side, but then the trend it continues, whether it's on Union Avenue or um, North Broadway, you've got big frontage house lots and what's behind them? <laughs> Carriage houses because those are service roads for the most part. And the whole idea is if you're gonna have things delivered there, it's in the back door, not the front door. And then the other thing, and this was something we talked about years ago, was your wealth was determined by how close your horses were to you. If you didn't have much wealth, you rented a horse, you went to a livery stable. If you had money and you had a stable, you built a stable. If you had real money, you built your stable a long ways away so you didn't smell it. And you had help that went and got the horses and brought them to you. So 
all of these are pieces you got to look for in terms of the evolution. This is our patchwork. And uh, again, all these kind of things are, are what I just covered, but uh, they're going to set the, the model for it. And then we start to build. And these houses, this is just a spray of houses. When I was in working at the museum a few weeks ago, I was pulling these and I didn't try to match what you had on the tour or anything else. Just, you know, different looks and things. And uh, I'm not going to go into this is what these guys are good at. The architectural elements that are found here. Sam's uh, tour of North Broadway is phenomenal. And uh, she can go through all that with you in the summer. And you can take a look and see how well they're nestled in here, how they look and how grand. Phenomenal. So there were some trees left behind. No, in fact, there was a lot of replant, and I, I've got that coming up. Uh, this is the old Henry house there. Um, notice the double row. You gotta, you gotta believe me. I was looking for a picture in the collection for quite a while, and I couldn't find it. Uh, we only have three hundred twenty-five thousand pictures, so <laughs> somehow I misplaced it. But um, there was a beautiful picture looking north on, on North Broadway that showed the tree lines on both sides of the street and they were double and they would all grow over and give you a tremendous amount of shade. The elms and everything that were up there were phenomenal. And of course, we all know um, most of us in the room growing up, the elm trees were coming down all the time because of Dutch elm disease, uh, stuff like that. But lots of trees. I put this one in on purpose. I know it's a long ways away and everything else, but can you see the front steps? No, because they're covered in snow. <laughs> and nobody shoveled them. <laughs> they weren't here. <laughs> if there was a watchman, they were coming in the back door anyhow. So it just gives you an idea of what it looked like if these were occupied during the, the summer months only. Uh, North Broadway would be buttoned up and kind of go to sleep for the winter. So, Susan, question? I, I remember as a kid, we talked about the bottle house. So somehow, yeah. why were the bottles there? What's that story about the bottle house? You captured them, right? Did he manufacture the bottles? Yeah, Sam, do you know any of that? I, that's one of those, uh, I'm not spelled deeply in, but I believe it's similar to what she said, but because the building doesn't exist anymore on my tour, I, and there aren't really any pictures of that. I, I, well, I, mean, I, I don't know of any in our collection, but the <clears throat> they're still. Yeah, yeah, but I don't think there's hard, I mean, I, I've tried to find of the bottle house, I haven't. So, when, when you don't have a building, you, yeah. only hear, you know, it's hard to, yeah. Uh, the only thing is, and recently on that Idle Stairs, I was one of those that came up. One of them came up, and somebody, the lady who did the tour of the Broadway took a picture from Florida. She identified one of them from Rob Oh, really? Yeah, I remember seeing it on there. That's not authority necessarily. Yeah, right. But that's one sort you may try to find. Yeah. Neat. One of those yeah, right. Yeah, there's a flood of stuff there that it's not part of our collection and it just comes in and it's great. It's a great resource. Charlie, yeah. is that home? can you just let us know what the bottle house is for what, the, what your conversation just was for the people on the Oh, okay. Um, <clears throat> let me ask our you know people to kind of fill in. It was a house up in that neighborhood that the walls were constructed of, I believe it was mortar. And and yeah, glass so, bottles. And glass bottles yeah, you could see them. Yeah. So, yeah, circular bottom piece. Stuff. Yeah. Yeah, and they were with different colors. Isn't there a house over? Um, it's on the east side. It's near Fasic Tipton that has like one section of it. Oh, I don't know. I that. thought I thought that was on your scavenger hunt. And I don't know who was in the White House back then. It was a long time ago, but it was a long time ago. And I remember that had an element because I, I remember going with the team and we found it. But I'd have to rethink that tremendously. Do you, do you know that one, Hollis? No, thank you. It's on like Tipton Lane or something like that. Oh. It's kind of stuck in. It's it's not on a on a Nelson Avenue or whatever. I've got my eyes out. I'm watching my dogs. OK. OK. So does, I don't know if that helps, Nicole. So. Um, so we're talking tree line streets back then. We had ourselves a beautiful setting. And that's why even up until the early 1900s, these big houses were being built up in that area. It was the place to be and still is. Uh, the porches were an integral part. Uh, I remember growing up in Saratoga, 
blue collar neighborhood, we didn't have air conditioning. We had a big porch and everybody around us had a big porch and we all sat on that big porch and we did it in the dark and everybody yelled at each other a little bit, but it was, uh, it was we just- We yelled from our porch, but no one ever answered. <laughs> <laughs> it was the cemetery across the street. <laughs> <laughs> that could cut down on the amount yeah, yeah. of activity you have, yeah. But, uh, you know, it's just some of those great elements. And again, you're gonna find this because all of these great things were being incorporated in these houses. Now, I am not going to try to turn this into a who's who discussion. I just threw up some of the names of people that built houses on Broadway, North Broadway, and what they did. And some of them have so many other things beyond what I listed. But <clears throat> owners of hotels and county judges and bottling plant owners and hotel owners and Troy businesses and things like that. And then a few more here, uh, Clark Textiles and New York railroads and shirt manufacturers and things, big money. And there's other names up there and they continue to change as you we know. You know, one thing that I heard, the man that developed the gel capsule so that you could put medicine in and people weren't swallowing powders and so on. Right. Didn't he make a lot of people a lot of money because people invested? And yeah. I'm so sorry. Yeah. <laughs> that wasn't that wasn't part of the Harvey company, was it? I think so. Yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah, I. Oh, okay. Yeah. So. Okay. Um, we're talking about the fact that uh, there were a lot of innovations, and there was a, a drug manufacturer that was in Saratoga, GF Harvey that produced a lot of different Saratoga ointments and other types of tonics and treatments and stuff. And we were just discussing how uh, their success has also led to houses in that North Broadway area. So. so as I'm wrapping things up, this is a great publication. There's other ones out there, but uh, this one by preservation, will go through all the different neighborhoods. And then this is the point I'm trying to make out there and take advantage of a lot of the tours that are available now that COVID's starting to, to wane. Um, the Saratoga Visitors Center, which is closed, uh, I remember years ago when I was on their board, we had rewritten a lot of the tours uh, for the Mineral Springs, East Side, West Side, North Broadway, stuff like that. They can still be found if you go to their site, um, if you get the drop down on maps and brochures, everything's in PDF and you can print them and everything else or put them on your phone and and go and take advantage. Or notice what's in bold print. The summer strolls, yes. which are coming out and Nicole will have that um, schedule in a few weeks. And um, they're always great. I know Sam kind of alluded to that at the beginning, um, but these are the ways that you can systematically learn more about. These guys know, uh, I, I was a geologist and an astrophysicist. I'm not an architect. So I don't know Queen Anne from, you know, all this other stuff. And I know it and I know when to get out, okay? <clears throat> when to fold them, when to hold them. But I gotta tell you, um, these guys know their stuff. Hollis does a lot of good tours. There's a lot of good stuff out there and there's so much more to be learned. But what I wanna leave you with is the concept is, is my initial premise is our city's kind of like quilts all joined together with different neighborhoods. Is this something you can re relate to after me having you here for an hour? <laughs> yes. So thank you very much. And uh, that will be the end of our, our talk for today. Thank you. And um, I'll be glad to entertain any questions that we have here. Yes, Jane. So how did it happen that the railroad came to Saratoga? Well, there were a group of um, local business people that knew that this so-called invention was possible in the works. They um, put some money together to try to build a coalition. Then they went and imagined through normal channels, I don't think there was a lot of uh, backstabbing or anything. They petitioned the um, New York State Assembly in 1831 asking to raise the, the ability to raise money for the project with bonds. And if I'm not mistaken, I think it was between 150 and 185,000 was the max that could be raised by selling bonds for that Schenectady Saratoga rail line. And it was 20 miles, 21 miles in length, I believe it was. And um, they, they got it. And then of course it improved. 
and then the rail systems improved. But what, what was so neat is when you look back, you find that the coordination was beautiful. In the old days, if you were coming to Saratoga, you did not have an easy trip. I had um, a, um, um, I, guess, I guess it was a diary entry from a woman in uh, Mobile, Alabama. In fact, I got a call from Mobile's um, History Society on this. She recorded that she wanted to come to Saratoga for the summer out of Mobile, Alabama. She got on a sailing ship, went all the way around Florida, came up to New York Harbor, arrived, and then of course, Robert Fulton's got a steamship that'll take them up the Hudson. Then they get to basically Albany, they get off, and she goes the last eight hours on a stagecoach to Saratoga. Eight hours. Eight hours. Now, now you think about the eight hours, and then I always think about the condition of the roads. And she might have been traveling north and south, but her body parts going east and west. I mean, there, there's no doubt about the fact that, you know, that was easy. And she commented in her diary that that was the best part of the trip. It was the easiest part. So when, once that real rail came in, perfect, then all of the uh, sailing ships in the summer on the Hudson coordinate so you can jump on the evening train in Saratoga, get down and make a ship that sails overnight down to New York, a steamship, and arrive in New York City by breakfast. So the coordination, because people, America's great, isn't it? Let's make money. And as a result, <laughs> it, it it's it's the mother invention and it's like yeah people will do this more often so they do and of course a lot of businessmen would send their families up here and then stay in the city and work and come up on occasion so all of that was into it so i know i've answered a lot more than what you asked but i apologize yes so i'm guessing that you know with money old money gambling booze alcohol you know that's what they did the other things a lot of crime yeah um but of course, you know, identify how much, you know, and, and, and part of the problem is, um, and we were just talking about this in the hallway, um, notoriety can come from doing something bad, but a lot of the stuff that is written about the big families coming and stuff like that, it's all, it's all Pollyanna, it's all fun stuff. But there were a lot of crud that came here. Because when you got big money coming someplace, you got people coming to try to separate them from it. And, um, you know, th there were noticeable people at certain times. And then as we uh, closed down the casino, the Canfield Casino becomes, you know, owned by the city. And then the mobs come in and run the lake houses. Then you start getting a lot of different things that happened. And growing up, I'm sure a lot of everybody else that grew up here. Uh, heard the stories of what went on at the lake houses and who shot who and what body got dropped off in front of uh, the hospital and things like that. But uh, yeah, I would imagine there was. But again, you know, it's, it's not good for the chamber. So it doesn't get recorded all the time. So, <laughs> Nicole? We have a certain question that says, how did people get across the Mohawk River prior to the railroad to get from Albany to Saratoga Springs? Ferries? Yeah, there was, there was quite a system of, of people that had different ferries that would ferry you across with your, you know, <laughs> livestock or whatever. So, uh, and then bridges came in eventually. But of course, the bigger the span, the longer it took for that to happen with the engineering. But uh, yeah, those kind of things. So, yes, ma'am. I read this in, uh, I think it's the uh, former police chief's Oh, yeah, Greg's book. Book. Yeah. Um, that, uh, Matilda Street had a, had some kind of speakeasy and gambling den and that actually a young Lucky Luciano would come and, you know, kind of run it. Um, and that Saratoga County was the only place that he was ever arrested. <laughs> <laughs> Is that true? I don't know that. Greg, Greg and I signed an agreement. No, we, we, made, <laughs> uh, we, we made an agreement a few years ago. I mean, he's all about crime and as former police chief, I think that's great. Um, I've just never dabbled in all of those intricacies. I always, always defer those questions to him because I don't feel like I, I really understand that. So I don't know if in his life that was the only arrest. Um, for a lot of reasons, I would question that just because how Saratoga was set up. Everybody was on the take, <laughs> so, but, but whatever, <laughs> you know, so yes, yeah, Susan. Um, I remember my mom telling us that when she was young, 
no Saratovians were allowed to go to any of the casinos that, that you had to have a hotel key. Yep. And she got to go to one once through, I guess, well, we had a hotel. Yeah, right. And she had a hotel key. But my question is, was that a law or was that something the casinos cleverly said they won't yell at us if we don't let the people get hurt? Well, well, John Morrissey probably did not invent the concept, but was probably the most prolific at keeping it going because when Morrissey built the casino in, in Congress Park, um, the one thing he feared was the fact that people, locals, would lose. And then there would be a lot of bad will in town. It was a smart move. It was a totally smart move. I mean, he made coalitions all over the place. Like he suspended gambling on Sunday so he could make friends with, with uh, yes, all the churches and stuff were happy with that. Um, the other thing which he did um, by keeping locals out on top of that was he made huge donations to nonprofits. They loved him. And that's why when the city council would have those discussions on when are we going to run these gamblers out of town, they would always go, uh, he's such a nice guy. Yeah. Can we do it next year? You know, <laughs> and stuff like that. But he, he dispersed a fair amount of money and people were happy with it. And basically, if you think about it, people were like, well, none of us got hurt. And we all made money on it. So it worked out. Yeah. Yeah, the law was they would prosecute the grand jury in October. <laughs> bring all these people in. Then they have the election in November. <laughs> they dropped the charges. Oh. <laughs> See, it's a fun place to live. <laughs> so, yes, ma'am. It's all about the gravity of what role Henry Paul's ball play do you think in the attraction of this area and territory? Well, I mean, in the um, in the old tour guides, uh, there's an evolution in the tour guides because as transportation gets easier. Um, in the tour guides, they highlight coming to Saratoga, of course, but they also highlight that if you're in Cape Cod, if you're in Niagara Falls, your places like that, um, it's a short drive, it's a short rail trip or whatever. Um, so a lot of the bigger events or bigger draws were coming into play. I don't ever remember, and it's, you know, it's not that I know for sure. I've just never seen the Coase Falls um, at a level that it was no, you know, had notoriety, but um, they were definitely starting to go different places. And that's where we've had the discussion that as the transportation changes, the whole demographics and the whole setup of hotels, we've overbuilt. By the time we get to the 1930s, 40s, 50s, we've overbuilt. We've built for people to stay in hotels for the whole summer. And they're not staying the whole summer. They've got cars and now they can spend two weeks here and go someplace else. So that's why the big hotels are going to come down and, you know, strong survive the weak die. It's really, it's a Darwinian economics when you look at how easy it is. If you don't have people coming in, you're not paying the bills and stuff like that. So we go to a smaller, leaner, compact move. So. Anybody else? I heard something when people started renovating the North Broadway buildings, the insides were kind of carved in the walls and stuff. So it was more or less just dressing on the outside, the buildings themselves might have been kind of more haphazard than you think. I have heard that. I I do kind of uh, have a bunch of friends that are in construction and a lot of times they will make the statement, you know, when people say, oh, they don't build them like they used to. Oh, they go, well, you, you, Rich, Martin is well R Rich and I are best friends. So I wasn't going to quote him, but at the, at the same time, <laughs> but, but he used to say, yeah, you know, I'm glad they don't build like that anymore because a lot of times the dimensional two by fours or sixes were scabbed up through and it was like, no, you could get a, a good eight foot run and no, they didn't have, yeah, exactly. So. Anybody else? Just one quick one. Sure. Um, the movie Saratoga Trump with ah, uh, Gary Cooper. Yeah, Ingrid Bergman, yeah, my favorite. One of my favorites. Absolutely. Um, it's the only movie in the world that mentions Binghamton. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't exactly the only movie in the world. Is that based on our line? I mean, the line that came into the city? Well, yeah, it's a little bit past. I think the um, the timing on it is a little bit past it because it's not exactly 1832. It's, it's beyond that. And more rail systems. And, and now they're really fighting over, like the DNH is starting to come in. And that's a 
fantastic look at how DNH Railroad started out as a canal company and they were moving things on canals and then they found they couldn't build the canals right so they made railroads and all this and then they started coming up through from Pennsylvania and stuff like that. So you mean each they had to build their own railroads? Yeah. Mm -hmm. They didn't share them. Well, eventually, but, but in the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. So that's why you had to have a lot of, you know, capital and stuff like that. And that's why the initial one, like with Saratoga, like Jane has, you had to raise the money in order to go 21 miles of, of rail and everything else. So I don't know. I've always wondered what, what they thought when, when it was written is. What would yeah. be the exact date? I thought maybe a screenwriter came from here or something like that. Well, we we've had screenwriters and things come out, but that, that's an, that's another talk. Yeah. Right there, so. there. Anybody else? I'll tell you, this has been a phenomenal birthday present. So thank you for being so kind to me. I appreciate it. So thank you. Happy birthday. Don't meet me, but we did have a Zoom request for Jane Happy Oh. Oh. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. It's set. Where's that bottle of All vodka? Right. <laughs> Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Charlie. Happy birthday, Happy birthday to you. Hooray. Thank you one and all, and all I hope for is world peace. Any <laughs> more, Charlie. Well, <laughs> but uh, thank you. Thank you, Charlie. Uh, okay. I always learn something every time, so it's great. Yeah, um, most of it's true. Oh. <laughs> um, again, I just want to thank all of you for coming. I remind you about the virtual tour. Uh, there's still like one hour left to go check out uh, the Rehab in Progress, which is the former uh, Masonic Lodge, which was the Ludlow House, which was built by the gentleman who um, his father and his son uh, had the valve company. They, his father uh, did the patent for the valve that was used in fire hydrants all across the country. He, and there's remnants of his fire suppression system in there and how the house has changed when, when the Masons uh, created their space. So you have until two o'clock to do that if that's of interest, but it's an interest, it's really an interesting home and I'm pretty hopeful that we'll get to see it when it's done being rehabbed. So you might wanna check it out before. And then of course the virtual tour, which highlights Senator Brackett's home and the coach house behind it and uh, 748 North Broadway, uh, 199 Woodlawn, which is a, a stable that uh, was associated with 632 North Broadway, which was the Rickard house. So there, there's a lot of things that you can learn about um, that continues your experience of learning about our wonderful community. And I hope that you will join us on summer Sunday strolls and that we will see you all again in person at a historic homes tour and real houses all at once. So um, thank you again. And we appreciate your support and enjoy your day. Oh yes. yes I was oh yes. Make that oh yes. And you can um, go see all the rooms in the ha in the inn if you would like. And um, there are mugs. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Joe has generously giving you each a takeaway, a uh, Anne's Washington mug, and um, you can take your picture out by the the car out front and take take in this beautiful sight. And again, thank you to Joe and little. Uh, it, what is it, Little Market at Five Points, yeah. and our honorary committee um, su supporters, and also our corporate sponsors, who without their support last year and this year, you know, would have been a much different outcome for us. So thank you, everyone. Thank you.